Monterey in California. At least six people have been treated for broken bones, and one woman died of a heart attack after a sharp aftershock rattled through the L.A. area today. It measured 5.5 on the Richter, but it wasn't nearly as bad as last week's 6.1 Templar. It's 82 degrees on the ground, and local time in San Francisco is 2 p.m. Sir, would you like some more coffee? Oh, yes, please. Thank you. It's early afternoon in San Francisco, but for me, it's already late in the evening. I'm on my way to California to visit one of the most famous sleep research laboratories in the world to find out how my body still knows what time it is in England. It's easy enough to reset my watch to California time, but there are clocks inside my brain that are much harder to change. The idea that the brains of animals contain a timepiece as accurate as a man-made clock is not new. For centuries, people have been aware of the uncanny ability of birds to migrate southwards before the season changes. But it's only recently that we've learned that the human brain also contains an internal clock, a timekeeper that regulates our metabolism, our sleep, our sexual desires, and even our moods, an unseen pilot that charts and controls the daily activities of brain and body. But if we suddenly step from one time frame to another, our internal clock can become confused. Unlike the birds that wisely migrate in a north-south direction, I've moved westward, putting my brain eight hours adrift. It's natural to feel that unlike other animals, we consciously control the tempo of human life. Our patterns of work and holidays, our habits of sleep and meal times seem to us to be deliberate decisions rather than instinctive urges. But when we look closely, we find that many of the cycles of our lives, like those of animals that share the same rhythmic universe, are beyond our control. We too are slaves to clocks that tick in our brains. If we were to remove the cerebral cortex, that part of our brain that's evolved so much during the past 30 million years or so, we would essentially eliminate humanity. Beneath that, a brain not far different in size from that of a cat. We could take away even more, getting down to something like the brain of an iguana. Within this general area, the reptile below the mammal remains an inheritance that rules our lives. Despite its complexity, the thinking cortex can never fully escape the demands of the lower brain. In feeding, sex, and sleep, one area, the hypothalamus, exerts its authority through its action on two hormone-producing glands, the tiny pineal body and the crucial pituitary, glands that profoundly influence the body and shape our sense of time. This laboratory studies our most obvious rhythm, sleep. For us, it's usually a regular daily event. But in autumn, the shortening days have a far-reaching influence on the hypothalamus, which changes the behavior of many animals. Some of them store food for the coming winter. Others seek a safe place to hibernate. For them, the influence of the hypothalamus is all-powerful. It slows heart rate and lowers body temperature, producing a profound sleep. Within our homes, we're insulated from seasonal influences. We're usually unaware that the rhythms of our bodies also adjust to the longer nights, unless something goes wrong. You are in need of new snow tires. Don't let snowy conditions catch you unprepared. New snow tires from Jason in the state of Virginia, Pat Moore's biological clock is unusually sensitive to the coming of winter, and her hibernation used to take the form of severe winter depression. How have you been spending your time? Sleeping, eating, crying. Have you been able to enjoy activities and experiences that you ordinarily would find enjoyable? No. How have you been feeling about yourself as a person? Oh, thoroughly disgusted. 
I'm very disappointed in myself. She's watching a videotape of herself, made before her treatment began. When was this picture taken of you, Pat? This was ten and a half months ago. I guess it took two or three years before I was noticing what was happening to me. And I just realized that my summers were not as pleasant because I knew what was coming each year. How have you been getting along with other people lately? Um, well, I'm very irritable, but I just stay away from people as much as I can. Have you been having any difficulties accomplishing tasks? Yes. How about completing tasks? I don't. I, I try not to start any of that. Pat Moore's condition seems to affect a number of people where winter nights are long. Right now, it's, it's, it's constant. I don't, I don't seem to have a good period. How do you feel about the future? Uh, I don't see a future right now. For Pat Moore, the slowness and gloom of winter became an all-consuming depression. To understand Pat's illness, we have to know the way in which the clock in her brain detects the onset of winter. Like a growing plant, the brain is affected by the changing seasons. And for both plants and brains, light is the clue to the time of year. The shortening days that herald winter affect the behavior of many animals. And recent research has pinpointed the pathway by which the length of the day might affect the clock of the brain. Buried within the hypothalamus is a tiny cluster of nerve cells that receive signals from the eyes. These cells help us to distinguish night from day. They appear to function as a biological clock. They control the secretion of melatonin, a hormone released from the pineal gland during the night. In people who suffer from seasonal depression, the melatonin is produced much later at night than in normal individuals. The bright lights were an attempt to lengthen Pat's winter days in order to correct this deficit. And within about two or three days, she in fact came out of her depression and entered a state of energy and a good feeling that was very typical of her summer activity. I feel fine now. Um, I'm sleeping about six hours a night. Um, I get up about four o'clock in the morning. I sit in front of the lights, uh, about uh, three feet away from the lights, uh, for approximately two hours. Um, I do all my activities that are more passive. I write, uh, paint, read, listen to the radio. I'm doing everything that I love to do, and it's wintertime. I feel like something has been turned on in my brain that says, I'm awake, it's time to live. The lights have taken me out of hibernation. Somehow, the lights seem to put her hypothalamus, and thus her moods, onto a summer schedule. Today, I'm dying to get up in the morning. I enjoy everything I do. Clocks. Man-made clocks. Now tick off the hours and days, and determine the seasons. We've learnt to organize ourselves by clocks of our own making. But we can't escape the beat of our brains and the rhythms that tie us to the restless earth. If we speed up our activities, it's easier to see the natural peaks and dips that mark our days, months and years. Our brains are governed by the rhythms of the planet, the moon's monthly path across the night sky, the Earth's yearly orbit around the sun, the changing seasons. These relentless patterns of nature have powerful influences on the lower brain. What would happen to the rhythms of the human brain in a world where there was no day, no night, no summer, no autumn. In 1972, a French cave explorer, Michel Sifre, lived deep in a Texas cave for seven months. 
In the cave where I was, in Texas, it's semi-tropical uh, cave, you know. No sound, nothing. Darkness completely. At a certain moment, you decide you are awake. It's curious, because you are not sure. But, well, in moving the eyes, you know, you decide. Then, you wake. You, you open the, the light, and your day begins when you light on the light. Every day, for all those seven lonely months, Michel Sifre took painstaking measurements of all his vital functions. He recorded when he slept and when he woke, changes in his blood pressure, heart rate and body temperature, his ability to do complex manual tasks. Déjeuner, menu, 211, 211, okay. Somehow, okay. he seemed to know when to eat. Even without the sunset, he knew when it was time to prepare for sleep. But he confirmed a curious finding that animal studies had also revealed. His brain's day was not identical to the 24-hour solar day. Soon after he descended into the cave, Michel Sifra's daily cycle lengthened to 25 hours. So his hypothalamus, left uncontrolled, operated on roughly a 25-hour schedule. Most of us seem to have an internal clock like this that loses an hour a day, though the cycles of the sun normally reset it and force on us a day of 24 hours. What happens when we try to reverse our biological clock to the demands of a night shift? A mineral plant on the salt flats of Utah. Recently, a team of researchers attempted to adapt industrial shift work to the rhythms of the human brain. Dr. Charles Seisler of Harvard University led the team. Virtually all living organisms, from single cellular plants to mammals and human beings, have very prominent daily cycles or circadian rhythms in virtually all physiologic functions. Now, what happens when uh, we try to upset the apple cart and, and sleep at, uh, during the daytime and work at night is that we throw all these functions completely out of whack. It didn't matter whether I just got out of bed or just coming home, I was always tired. I really didn't get anything accomplished in my off hours that, uh, that I'd like to. The manager, Preston Ritchie, was worried about the men's performance. I went to the library and looked through all the industrial literature, trying to find anything on shift work that would tell me, you know, what the ultimate, the best shift schedule was, and there was nothing. And it was during this time I saw an article in the paper that said uh, Dr. Charles Seisler was working on shift work, so I gave him a call. He said that he had 130 men who were having trouble sleeping. And it's no wonder, since, as he described the schedule to me, uh, they had a rotating shift work schedule in which they rotated from day shift to night shift to evening shift every week. It's one of the most common schedules in the United States for people who do rotating shift work. And uh, that schedule turns out to be very disruptive to the various systems which time the release of hormones, which time the daily changes in body temperature and in alertness, which time the very sleep-wake cycle itself. In effect, the old schedule had the men trying to work in Utah one week in Paris the next, and Tokyo the third, as if they were jet-lagged by eight hours each week. The brain's 25-hour clock tries to delay the timing of sleeping and waking one hour or so each day. So, on Dr. Seisler's advice, the workers settled into each shift not for a mere week, but for three weeks at a time. Then they moved to a later shift, always in clockwise fashion. Day shift, changing to evening shift, then on to late night shift, and then back to day shift once more. I like it a lot better than what we had. I might like it better if it was four weeks at a time, I think, than, than the three, but... Basically, it did work, and it worked uh, uh, surprisingly well. The employees showed that they generally preferred the new schedule. They felt that their health was better. They felt better towards their job. Uh, but perhaps what was more surprising to me was some of the measures of productivity that we use to determine how well we're doing, our own internal standards, increased dramatically. 
and uh, basically what that means is money. Without the clock in the hypothalamus, our lives would be chaotic, our actions disorganized. This biological clock has internalized the rhythms of the universe and can tick on for months or years without sight of the sun. But how can a piece of brain, a wet living tangle of cells, act like a mechanical timepiece? Only in recent years has the beauty of the clockwork of the brain been revealed. Ring doves use their clock in a particularly elegant way. At Columbia University, Ray Silver and her colleagues have been investigating the bird's breeding cycle. It's part of a research program designed to investigate precisely how the brain's timekeeper works. Our search for the clock started in the early 70s. It's really only by studying animals that we can start to understand what these clocks are doing and how they do it. One of the things I always found fascinating about the ring doves, apart from their being so pretty, is that the male and female differ slightly in how they use their clocks. Their hormones influence the operation of the hands of the clock, and it's quite fascinating. The arrival of eggs presents a ring dove pair with a problem. To remain viable, the eggs must be incubated at 38 degrees centigrade. The temperature of the female's body is always higher than that of the male. During the day, her body gradually gets too hot for the eggs, so the cooler male must take over during the afternoon. The birds instinctively take turns at the nest. As his body temperature drops too low, the male leaves the nest, allowing the now just cool enough female to take over. A regular pattern is soon established. The female hands over to the male during the middle of the day. They change over at almost exactly the same time throughout the 15-day incubation period. And the male always does a single six-hour shift. If an internal clock dictates when the bird incubates, what happens if the male is prevented from taking his turn for a couple of hours? He's obviously restless, but the female waits patiently. He's anxious to relieve his hungry mate and appeases her with a gift as he takes over, clocking on two hours late. Will the female return at the usual time, now only four hours later? Yes, she's back at exactly four o'clock, the usual takeover time. However, her mate is now reluctant to leave and insists on completing his six-hour shift. So each bird has at least two clocks, one to say when to return, and another that tells it how long to sit on the eggs. Dr. Silver's group tried one further experiment. After removing the sex hormone producing glands from each bird, they inserted a pellet containing the hormone produced by the opposite sex. Males received estrogen and females testosterone. The effect was startling. The male now incubated during the early morning, and the female took over the midday shift. They'd completely reversed their roles. Sex hormones could reset the hands of their clocks. Well, we really did learn a lot studying ring doves. We were able to figure out what the clock does, and something about how it does it. We know how hormones interact with the clock. We don't know where in the brain the clock lies. It's just not a very clearly defined locus now. But recently, by studying the hamster, we have had much better success. We know where the clock lies, it's a very accurate clock, and we've been able to study its function by actually transplanting it from one animal to another. Hamsters, of course, are nocturnal, and so they sleep during the day, and they're awake at night. The records that are pinned to each bin show the activity patterns of the animals day after day. Over here, what you see is an animal that's active during the night, becomes inactive during the day when the lights come on, and then becomes active again at night when the lights go off. And by looking at the overall activity pattern, you can see that organization. Over here, you can see a change in the pattern of activity. At this point, we've removed the part of the brain that controls the clock, and the animal becomes very arrhythmic in what it's doing. It still does everything normally. It eats, sleeps, grooms, runs around, but it doesn't do it at the right time of day. They removed the suprachiasmatic nucleus, 
that tiny cluster of timekeeping cells in the hypothalamus. Then they did a remarkable experiment, which proves that this nucleus is a sort of master clock. They took fetal tissue from the same brain area and put it back into the hamsters who had lost their sense of time. As you can see, the animal's activity is irregular for all these days. And then over here, we implant the donor tissue. And several days later, a clear, strong, free-running activity pattern emerges. Although the implanted clock appears to work, it's not yet certain that such grafts can rewire themselves into the brain's circuits and reconnect to the eyes. The graft, the dark area of this section, has taken beautifully, but it may be signaling the time with hormonal messages. Well, if it turns out that the way that this graft works is by producing a chemical cue that diffuses through the host animal, through the brain, then we could look forward to isolating that chemical cue and providing it by injection or perhaps by eating a tablet. Uh, in that way, you could correct sleep disorders, you could correct mood disorders, seasonal affective disorders, you could even help people overcome the problems of jet lag. And now, back at the Sleep Research Center at Stanford University, they were ready to investigate my jet lag and sleep patterns. The director is Bill Dement. Well, Colin, this is the equipment that will record your sleep. Literally every second of your journey through the night will be documented by this equipment and the various uh, sensors that you'll be wearing. Well, I hope I'm going to sleep for you. Well, I think you will, because it's eight hours different from London time. It's about 3 a.m. your time, so you should fall asleep right away. You look a little tired. <laughs> You might wake up a little early, but uh, I think you'll sleep pretty well. Good. So let's go and see where you'll be doing okay. it. It's in the next room. Well, I hope you're going to explain to me about uh, jet lag after I've had some sleep. Bill Dement and his team pioneered the procedures I was about to undergo. We were to discover, as he did 30 years ago, how to recognize a dreaming brain. This is our technician, Doug Yost, and he'll be attaching the electrodes to your scalp and around your eyes. and on your chin. We'll be recording brain waves through the night, mm -hmm. eye movements through the night, and muscle activity through the night. The sleeping brain is an active brain and it can fail. It can fail to regulate your breathing or your heart rate. And that can only be detected when you're asleep. Now I'm assuming you're a very healthy sleeper and we won't find a serious sleep disorder, but if we do, well, I'll send you a bill. <laughs> <laughs> Sensitive electrodes were going to be used to record my brain's internal activity. Once they're glued on, they can be used to monitor minute changes in the flow of electrical currents, reflecting the activity of nerve cells in the cortex below. They'll provide an electrical fingerprint of my sleeping brain. I wondered if I would sleep well in these strange conditions and what I might dream about that night. Okay, just do what comes naturally and don't worry about a thing. And uh, you'll have a very good sleep, I'm sure. And I'll see you in the morning. Okay, thank you. Good night. Good night. A good night's sleep produces more than 300 yards of paper. Sleep seems to be a highly organized process and can be divided into distinct stages that always occur in the same order. The next morning I asked Bill what had happened to me as I went through the night. Well, this is uh, the beginning, this is where you know, they say lights out, and I'm noticing a slight change in the uh, brainwave patterns, a little bit of slow activity is coming in, so this, this is extremely rapid uh, sleep onset, and I think that attests to the fact that you're tired. And but you told me I look, I look tired. Yeah. So it's like you were just were up on a high diving board and just jumped in and went right to sleep. Or it's quite a, and by this time, wow, uh, you're asleep at this point, so that is... Uh, falling asleep after lights out in 
two and a half minutes. I mean, that is really amazing. So in that moment, you go from wake to sleep, you go from seeing to being blind, you go from hearing to being deaf, I think is the most remarkable change in the entire neurobehavioral repertoire of human beings. And we also feel very certain it's an active process. So that your brain is actively disengaging from the environment. And then these changes in the brainwave patterns reflect that process. And in fact, I was going to ask you how old you are because this, this amount of high amplitude slow activity either means you're very sleep deprived or you're very young. Well, let's say I'm so very young. Okay. <laughs> how did the jet lag influence my sleep? The pilots on my plane seemed to think that the direction of travel was important. Chris, when you're doing long haul flights, do you ever get used to the problem of jet lag? Well, I never really got used to it, but I learned to plan for it. And uh, depending on the kind of flights that I had, if I flew to the west or uh, going to the Far East or down to Australia or New Zealand, I just realized that once I was out for anywhere from 10 days to two weeks, that once I got back, I knew my adjustment period would be anywhere from two to three days. So you find it easier coming from the east to the west than going west to east? Unquestionably. It's just, it's just easier flying all the way around for me. And most of the people that I've talked with, most of the people that I flew with, say the same thing. Well, if it's worse going from west to east, that means it's going to be bad for me heading back oh, yeah. home. Well, it, that's the typical thing. But it, you went, I don't see how you could fall asleep more quickly than you did last night. You know, if you do, it'll be a world's record. Uh, Recently, several pilots came straight from their international flights to sleep in this laboratory and in similar labs around the world. And the researchers found that what's true for cave dwellers and shift workers is indeed true for everyone. Our brain has a 25-hour clock. That's why it's easier to lengthen our day by going from east to west and to go to sleep later than normal. But why do we need to sleep at all? A clue came with Dement's discovery that sleep itself is punctuated by strange episodes of activity, the times when we dream. Here it is, the beginning of the first rapid eye movement period, the beginning of REM sleep, a total change in state of the of view of the organism. And here's a burst of rapid eye moves. This means your eyes are, are moving back and forth. But notice the muscle activity is also completely su suppressed. And this means that your brain is active, you're dreaming, and your body is completely paralyzed by active inhibition of alpha motor neurons. And here, Wes came in and woke you up after about five minutes of REM sleep. Colin, can you tell us what you're dreaming? Colin, do you remember your dream? Um, I was on an aeroplane and there was an earthquake and the aeroplane was bouncing up and down and I remember trying to ask the steward why the plane was moving when it should only be the ground the ground moving Ooh. Do you remember anything else? No. Okay, you can go back to sleep now. Thank you. These images show hours of sleep compressed into a few seconds. Episodes of dream activity sweep across the brain every 90 minutes, like waves on a beach. Almost all mammals have bouts of REM sleep, which suggests that they also dream. Whatever it's for, dream sleep evolved with the enlarged cortex of the first mammals. Surely it must be important for brain function. Right, I'll take some measurement pictures. Dr. Jason Bernholtz has been using ultrasound scanners to examine fetuses in extraordinary detail. They too have the telltale eye movements of REM sleep 
Indeed, unlike adults, they spend most of their time in this state. But what could she be dreaming about before she's experienced anything of the world? It's a discovery that Freud would have found hard to explain. So far, the little lady looks very good. Oh, well, it's great to see them looking out at you. There's the okay. mouth and the nose. Looks oh. like your nose. Yeah. Like mom's nose. Hmm. That bright white circle, the edge of the bright white circle, the eye itself, actually it's the lens of the eye. And what we look for is to see if there are rapid eye movements and they'll occur in little flurries. In fact, you notice every once in a while that there are these very short but very jerky fast movements that occur. In adult sleep, rapid eye movements are a sign of dreaming. But why then should a fetus in the womb spend so much time in REM before it's seen anything to dream about? Well, that's still a mystery, but perhaps it means that this stage of sleep has something to do with organizing circuits in the brain. We now know what happens to the brain during REM sleep, and it helps us to understand how dreams are generated. Giant nerve cells in the lower brain fire bursts of impulses. This electrical activity travels to areas of the cortex that are normally involved in movement and vision. These signals affect the brain in the same way as real events in the outside world. The brain has to account for these strange visions, so the frontal cortex acts as a storyteller, trying to make sense of them. The story it tells is the dream. But why do we spend so much time asleep and dreaming? The world is a dangerous place and the law of the jungle applies. Animals obey it nearly all the time, except when they close their eyes and sleep. During dream sleep, we become particularly vulnerable. Our brains remain active, but the messages to the muscles are damped. The reception of information from the senses nearly cut off. To give up all defenses in such a world seems ridiculous. So there must be a trade-off. The risks must be exceeded by the benefits. Benefits that might flow from the strange world of dreams. To the Greeks, sleep and death were rival brothers, gods of the underworld. In the imagination of artists and seers, dreams were foretastes of death and offered visions of the future. To psychoanalysts, a stage on which our wildest fantasies could be enacted. To others, a time of creative thought. Vienna, Austria, 1865. The chemist August Kekulé was faced with a scientific problem, determining the structure of the compound benzene. Kekulé knew that benzene contained six carbon atoms, but how were they arranged? For years, he worked on the problem. But one night he dreamed of snakes, six of them. They writhed and twirled through his fantasy. Then each snake bit the tail of the snake ahead of him, and they formed a circle. When Kekulé awoke, he had the answer. The carbons, like the snakes, were joined one to another. Benzene was shaped like a ring. Is dreaming mainly a way to help us solve problems? Why, I wonder, did I dream of an earthquake in an aircraft? Francis Crick, famous for his work on the genetic material DNA, has now moved into brain research. He too is working in California, and he's interested in the relationship between dreams and memories. One of the things that Freud described about dreams is what's called condensation. You, of course, dream largely about what happened in the last day or two, but it's very rare to dream exactly what happened. You dream a mixture of what happened. And Freud gives an example where he dreamed of a, a, a man and he'd mixed up in this man a schoolmaster he'd known and a doctor. And he asked his mother when he woke up, why did he do this? And she pointed out both of them had got only one eye. So what you actually do in condensation is you mix up things which have something in common. 
In the brain, synaptic connections between nerves may be used to store memories. Thousands of synapses within the neural net used in different combinations can specify different memories. It's an efficient system, but if the network is overloaded, memories can get jumbled together. Dreaming each night may help to sort them out. We invented a mechanism, Mitchison and I, which we call reverse learning, in which by putting in a random input and then tinkering with the synapses in a particular way, you can push the memories a little further apart. But what we believe is that in the brainstem, there is a system which sends up activation, the so-called PGO waves, during REM sleep, and is giving the brain, as it were, a series of shocks, which is what we want for our theory. And we believe that that spills over, not by going up to the brain and back around, but going directly to the eyes. It hasn't been worthwhile to turn that off. Just, of course, body movements are largely turned off, but presumably it isn't necessary to turn off turn off eye movements. So we have no function for them. We merely say uh, it, it, it hasn't been worthwhile to suppress them. People have searched for ways to interpret dreams for centuries. But what Francis Crick is now saying is remarkable. The content of dreams may be unimportant, almost random. The product of electrical activity designed to readjust the wiring of the brain. But if dreams have such a valuable general function, why do they only occur in mammals? The whole question of sleep in the lower vertebrates, in reptiles and amphibia and fish, is a very difficult one. And it could be, you could simply argue, um, that th because of the higher cognitive ability of mammals, and to some extent birds, they need this extra process. What we would predict is that if you didn't have this process, you would have to have a bigger brain so you could store the information. You wouldn't have to push it apart. And the two cases where we think a mammal doesn't have REM sleep, which are in dolphins and the spiny anteater, they do have, by almost, you might say, perhaps a coincidence, unusually large brains. So we would say the function of REM sleep is to make your brain more efficient so that you can, as it were, do the same job with a, a, a smaller number of neurons. But then if dreams are so important, what would happen if we couldn't dream? Well, we would think that you would get things more confused. You should become more poetic if you have <laughs> less REM, because in poetry, that's what you do. You associate things which have something in common, like the ship plows through the ocean, you see. And it's those associations which you're probably damping down in REM. So if you want to be a very matter-of-fact chap and not be poetic, then you should get rid... Of, you, uh, you, you, should, you should have more REM so that you can push the ideas apart. If you want to be a poet, presumably you shouldn't dream too much, curiously enough. Just the opposite of what is usually said. <laughs> <laughs> Dreaming, sleeping, working, eating and drinking. They all have their own cyclical patterns, their own clocks and regulators in the core of the brain. And so too do courtship, love and sex. The hypothalamus is also the center of the drive to reproduce. The lengthening spring days bring another change in the clocks of the brain, and the hypothalamus is put into top gear. It's time to seek a mate. Sexual activity starts in the hypothalamus. For arousal to occur, it must send a releasing hormone, a chemical messenger, to the master gland, the pituitary, located nearby. The pituitary, in turn, sends out its own hormones via the bloodstream to the sex organs. Once activated, they release yet another hormone. If you're male, it's testosterone. It's a delicate amplification system that enables the whole body to hear the brain's excited whispers. I am a man, and I wanted to live my life as I viewed a normal man. To have a normal sex life, and to have the libido, the wants, and the desires of a normal man. I was just explaining a rule to the referee. He didn't appreciate it. Mitch Heller, engineer, amateur hockey player, sports enthusiast, red-blooded man. In August of 1978, I was in an automobile accident. And then about a month after that, I realized that I didn't have as much interest in sex. 
Uh, I couldn't perform as well. It was, it was very scary. I guess what I was afraid of was that I would either turn back into a prepubescent male or just start gaining the traits of a woman. Uh, my voice would get higher. I would uh, lose all my uh, facial hair. Nice game, Neil, baby. I guess I was both horrified and concerned. I knew something was going on inside my body, and I didn't know what. I've wanted children since I was a little girl. And Mitchell didn't immediately, so we decided that we would wait. But we knew we would have a family one day. When Mitchell first lost his libido, I naturally assumed that it was me. And I was crushed, but I loved him and I believed him. And I accepted that it was probably something physical and that it just wasn't me or us. I knew something was wrong with my body, physically. And she understood that. And she made it a lot easier to cope. But physically, Mitch had suffered only a bump on his head. It took months to discover the real problem. It was very scary. Not knowing how you're going to react to things, what you're going to look like, what you're going to feel maybe five years down the road. Finally, I was referred to Dr. Crowley at Mass General. William Crowley in Boston is interested in the three-way conversation between the hypothalamus, the pituitary gland, and the sex organs. Mitch is, ex is a good example of how much can be learned from a single case. Uh, we confirm several things by uh, the research studies done in him. The first of which is that he did have a defect in the hypothalamic secretion of gonadotropin releasing hormone. I think that as we view reproduction now, it was er understood very early on that the hypothalamus, this area of the brain that sits over the pituitary, was essential for normal functioning of the pituitary and the gonads, or testicles in men and ovaries in women. The hypothalamus alerts the pituitary, which sends hormonal messages to the sex organs. The pituitary functions much like a strobe light, blinking on and off throughout the course of the day. And it is this rhythmicity that is essential for normal function. And only by administering the hypothalamic message in a pulsatile fashion could the normal physiology and normal endocrine conversation of the hypothalamus, pituitary, and gonads be mimicked. And all of the symptoms that you're experiencing in terms of decreasing libido and potency and loss of beard uh, growth are all secondary to the testosterone deficiency, which in turn is secondary to this chain of events going back to the hypothalamus. When I first met Dr. Crowley, where he explained the research program, I was excited. I had been a year and a half without treatment, and finally here is the first person who was offering me any kind of treatment at all. And the way Dr. Crowley explained it, it was very exciting for me being an engineer and working with state-of-the-art type engineering problems. Here's somebody who's working with state-of-the-art medical problems, my medical problem. Here is the medication, which is the hypothalamic releasing hormone in this syringe. And this is a needle which is inserted subcutaneously in the abdomen. So this remains on your belt, this remains under the skin of the abdomen, and this does the administration of the hormone automatically at two hourly intervals. It's like a portable hypothalamus. That, that's a fair description of what it does, in fact, uh, because it's designed to mimic the function of your hypothalamus, which for some reason or other has decided not to secrete this hormone any longer. The first day in the hospital, they put it on me. That was a Monday. On Tuesday, if I could have taken the pump and thrown it through the window, there'd have been no problem with me breaking that window. Here I was with a needle in my belly. It wasn't very comfortable. Never thought I'd ever get used to it. I felt every time the inje an injection was given to me, I felt it. Same thing on Wednesday. On Thursday, it got a little better. By Friday, I was totally used to the pump. I knew right then and there that was going to be part of my body. That was going to be my portable hypothalamus. I had two 
reasons for wanting to wear the pump. My first reason was that I wanted to live a life as a normal man. The second reason is I wanted to be able to have children. And wearing the pump gave me both. When Mitchell first started having treatment with Dr. Crowley, the first signs were increased chest hair and an increased libido. It was almost like magic, and it was wonderful. When I got home from the hospital after a week of being on the pump, I had the urge to go to bed with my wife. That was the first indication. It was about five and a half months after I started wearing the pump. Dr. Crowley came in on one of my visits, came in and said, your count went up. It was up to, it was in the several million. It's still not in the totally normal range, but it was several million. He looked at me and told me that, and I looked at, at him and I said, Dr. Crowley, Debbie's 12 days late for our period. And he said, how do you, you know, I, I, have you been taking her temperature? Yes. Is her temperature still up? Yes. How regular is Debbie? Extremely regular. As it turned out, Debbie was pregnant. Nine months later, we had a baby daughter. I actually had a camera at the birth taking pictures, but I never saw what I was taking pictures of because the tears, the tears of joy were just filling my eyes. I could not see through the camera. It's very difficult to describe in words what Tova means to us. Any, any person who has a child thinks their child is special. Tova is a miracle baby. The real breakthrough here is the restoration of brain function by artificial means. Research into the brain's rhythms, both the obvious ones and the more subtle ones, is enabling us to help people with disorders of those rhythms and to understand better the machinery beneath the mind. It's only when our animal brain fails us that we realize how much we needed it all along. Perhaps one day, Mitch's rhythms will be restored permanently by a transplant technique like Ray Silver's using on hamsters. But already, we've learned enough to reproduce artificially the rhythms of life. Our work, our rest, our play are regulated. Our desires, our passions, our loves are controlled. Our days, our nights, our seasons are orchestrated by ancient parts of the brain, far from the conscious mind. The rhythms of human life reveal our kinship with the animals with which we share this restless world. <laughs> 